Let's say your engineering team has to build two features, but there's only bandwidth to build one of them. What do you do as the engineering manager? Hey everyone, welcome back to another Exponent Engineering Manager mock interview. My name's Kevin, and on today's show, we have Vidal. We're gonna be doing a behavioral or leadership type question today. And before we get into that, Vidal, do you mind just telling the audience a little bit about what you do and who you are? Sure, my name is Vidal Garpera. I'm an engineering manager currently at LinkedIn, and I, um, I lead a couple teams there. I'm really passionate about engineering, leadership, and management. I, um, I also have a website and podcast where I write about it as well. Great, thanks for coming on today's show. So we're gonna be doing a leadership or behavioral type question today, and this is what I like to ask. Let's say your engineering team has to build two features, but there's only bandwidth to build one of them. What do you do as the engineering manager? Okay, um, well, part of it depends on the company. So I'll tell you a couple of different companies I've worked at. For example, uh, when I worked at Walmart, it was a very, very data-driven company. And so <clears throat> there, I led an engineering team that worked on a mobile website and I would get requests all the time for features. And so in this case, say we had two features, we only had bandwidth to build one, okay? We had a North Star, which was to increase the conversion rate of the website. That was the most important thing. It came from uh, senior management, plus everyone on the team agreed that this would be the thing that'd be most impactful. So when product managers would come with feature requests, um, it would always ask them, okay, how much do you think this is going to move the conversion rate, right? Do you have a theory for how much it'll improve it or how it will improve it? If we had any kind of data to show, that'd be even better. And then the team would do, uh, I, you know, so that's the data they would give us, right? And then the team, I also could estimate the effort, right? So the engineering team would estimate the effort of the feature and we would look at the impact to effort ratio, right? How much is gonna move the conversion rate based on the effort? So in this case, if we had two features, if they were equal effort, we'd look at which one would improve the conversion rate more or that we believed would improve it more. Um, otherwise, we would just you know, do this um, impact effort calculation in that case. Um, cool, so, so it sounds like you would look at the company goal and then you would also look at some matrix consisting of impact and effort. Yeah, how does this feature move like the big goal we have? In this case, in that team, it was to improve the conversion rate. So that was very, uh, very clear. Um, at another company I worked on, we had a list of prioritized programs, okay? So if two different features came in, um, we would see which program they mapped to and the higher priority program would get preference unless there was some extenuating circumstance that there wouldn't be. Um, I'll just say two more things there, which I think are, are helpful is one, it helps that the product managers that are coming to you, or whoever's asking for the features, kind of understands that process, right? They understand, hey, this is what we're, um, this is how we're thinking about it. We're trying to move this metric, or we're looking at this list of prioritized programs, and this is what we're going to do uh, so that they buy into it. But we also give them an escape valve, right? We say, okay, if you don't like the result, no offense, it's fine. Here's how you can escalate. You know, you can escalate to these people. And if they agree with you, you know, maybe we're wrong. And then we'll do the other feature. So as long as there's a clear escalation path and the process is clear, it's fine. And this happens all the time. I mean, this is like engineering manager job a lot when you're doing planning, whether you do quarterly planning, yearly planning, any kind of planning. What does that escalation process look like? So do you give them like the engineering directors or do you like, who do you link them up with? Well, uh, so like at LinkedIn, we have a very nice process for this. We have this uh, rapid process, which you, you know, may have read about. Um, so there's discussions, you know, between say me and the other engineering manager, then, you know, you can involve their manager. We try to find like a common point, you know, where there's um, a decision maker, okay? Maybe maybe we both fall into the same VP, for example. So then the, the VP might be the decision maker. There usually be some negotiation, 
we'll write up a document which lists the pros and cons of all the approaches and what the recommendations are. So it'll be like spelled out, you know, a little bit. I don't want to say it's like a legal brief, but, you know, the arguments will be laid out in writing. And then that will be sent up the chain and presentations will be made and decision will be handed down. I like that. Yeah, I think a written culture really helps people get their thoughts out and helps people be more comprehensive in thinking about decisions. So that, that sounds good for choosing the one of the two that you have to build. Let's imagine that the one that you choose is a progress bar, for example, in the UI. And let's imagine that there's some edge cases in the bugs. So the team is building this progress bar and sometimes the progress bar goes past 100%. Sometimes it goes to a negative percentage when it's not supposed to. Um, and the team is not going to meet the deadline. What would you do here? Okay, well, that's um, that these things happen also. So I would look at, um, first of all, how, you know, how important is it to meet the deadline, right? Can we extend the deadline? Like, what would it take to fix this bug? And is it acceptable to extend the deadline to deliver the bug? It could be, you know, I don't know what product this is going into, but say, we, I mean, it's not a good customer experience, right? So I'm always thinking about the customer a lot because I, uh, I manage front-end engineering teams. I've managed mobile engineering teams where things, I'd like stuff that customers can touch. And it doesn't look good, right, if the progress bar goes. So that'd be one thing. Okay, how much, what's it going to take to fix it? It's some amount of time. Um, you usually can't get an extension, but I, I'd want to ask anyway, right? Is that a possibility? What's the impact of this being late? Okay, like maybe it's no big deal if it's late an extra day or two, but maybe it's a really big deal. Maybe this is holding up some other, you know, it's not usually just the progress bar that's going out, right? It's going out, I would assume, as part of a larger project, right? So now if that's going to hold up a larger deliverable, which is going to have impacts, then we probably can't hold it up just for the progress bar. So then we're going to have to look at, well, what is the impact if the progress bar goes negative? Or positive. Okay, it looks bad, but is any user data going to be lost, right? That'd be the first thing. Like if user data is going to be lost, or there's going to be some financial impact or regulatory violation, there's some really bad thing like that, you know, then we might have to, to say, wait, we really have to stop this because, you know, we can't lose user data. We can't lose financial information, uh, you know, legally protected stuff. But a progress bar doesn't seem likely that it would have those kind of serious negative impacts okay so so that that makes sense for in the event that the progress bar cannot be uh moved so let's maybe talk about what could you do as the engineering manager if you learn that you can move the deadline well if we if we can move the deadline um i mean it might fix the bug right i think you're just using that as an example right like a progress bar is like a very tiny thing but if we could move the deadline there's no real impact to moving it. Um, I mean, there's also the cost, you know, here's the other thing too. Maybe we wouldn't even move the deadline if it's not that big a deal. I guess I'd really want to understand what is the impact. Again, I really hate to send stuff out that doesn't look good, but um, software does ship with bugs, right? Every piece of software out there has like known bugs that it goes out with. So maybe if the impact's not that bad, and there's lots of other goodness, you know, because the other delay is if we delay it, then all the other goodness that's just going out this feature will also be delayed, which might have far more negative impact to delay, right? So you could just put it in the release notes, sure. right? What does it say to your team, though, if you're allowing them to ship software with these known bugs? Well, um, look, I want to keep a high bar for for everything, but the reality is software does ship with bugs, right? Um, uh, video games ship with bugs, you know, all kinds of things have, you know, they're not perfect. Sometimes we don't know what the bugs are. So this is like a known bug. Um, I don't like to, I'd like it to be at a high level of craftsmanship, but um, I mean, these are things that I'd be kind of trading off in my mind, you know, how many people are going to see this? Um, okay, so you say the progress rate might go negative or over 100%. How many people, how likely is it that a customer is going to see this, right? If it's like one in a million customers in an odd edge case, then it's not that important. If you're saying every customer is going to see this bad experience, then I'm much more concerned, 
right? Um, so I guess I want to understand how many people are going to see this if it's a very, very tiny number. Maybe that's acceptable because to delay it would, like say 1% of people are going to have this experience, but if I delay it, 100% of people aren't going to have the other experience, which is better, right? By rolling the thing out, you'd have to make that kind of trade-off, I feel. Okay. Are there any sort of frameworks that you use at work when it comes to um, moving deadlines or is it mainly just thinking about the impact and going from there? It's a good question. I don't know if there's a formal framework that I'm aware of. I'm sure there is. There's formal frameworks for almost everything. Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. I guess I would, you know, I would look at the impact and try to see how many customers are going to be impacted. What's going to be the impact? Is it just cosmetic? Is it a devastating, you know, data loss thing? Um, and you have to make a judgment call whether it's worth delaying the product launch for this defect versus rolling it out and fixing it later, right? Knowing, as you say, yeah, it does, you know, it's like, it's not perfect. Nobody likes to send us stuff that's not perfect, but you can't be a perfectionist either. Got it. You, you mentioned something interesting where you mentioned how this could impact the release of a broader product. And I wanted to ask you, let's say that you, uh, the delay of this progress bar impacts the downstream roadmap for a larger, like maybe some super group uh, product. How would you communicate that impact to the roadmap to your stakeholders? Well, then you'd have to communicate it, right? So then it's, then it's not just a question of me deciding to delay the progress bar, right? Now it's like, hey, I have to move this release out because I have an issue that we believe we need to fix. And so now um, we're not gonna be able to start work on the next phase, which is gonna impact downstream roadmaps. So I'd have to talk with those other teams, let them know that you know I'm thinking of delaying the release because I have this issue and maybe they're okay with it. Maybe like, okay, that's fine. Or maybe they're not okay with it. Like, no, you can't do that. So I'd have to, you know, discuss, I just wouldn't do it unilaterally. I'd have to talk with them and say, hey, so what's going on? Um, you know, what do you think? Um, you know, assuming I think it's really like, you know, we really have to delay the release because this, um, this progress bar thing is like so bad. Got it. Yeah, so let's say you, you've done all this, the stakeholders, the people you work with, the leaders in the team are all happy with the direction, even though there is this delay. Now, how would you, um, like, what would you say to, to the team, I guess, just to keep team morale high and make them feel confident in their work? Um, yeah, I would say that, um, you know, we're going to fix the issue. You know, we want to have a good, customer experience, you know, I wouldn't try to, you know, blame anyone uh, for it, maybe, you know, at our retrospective, or if we had to do a postmortem of this, you know, you could do that, try to understand, um, you know, how this happened, right, so that we could prevent it happening in the future, right, I mean, no one, you know, again, no one intentionally would code a progress bar like that, right? So I don't assume any, you know, bad intent on anyone's part, you know? It's just like, oh, interesting, progress bars, how, you know, um, how'd that happen? What can we learn in the future? Okay, let's fix it, let's move on. Um, but th those would be some of the thoughts I'd have. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, not blaming anyone, uh, making sure that you have a retro to think about what went well, what didn't go well. Um, totally makes a lot of sense. We can stop the mock interview here. Thanks for your time. And I'm thinking now that now, now that you were kind of put in the seat of the interviewee, do you have any advice for the viewers who might be going through their own engineering manager interviews? Oh, like general advice for interviewers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or people who are people who are going into engineering manager interviews? Yeah, they're going into it. Well, um, there's a lot of resources now. I know that Exponent has resource, right? Like you have launched a course. Uh, I've written a book on the topic. I think other people have written books on this topic. Um, there's, uh, I think you should prepare for it. You should prepare for it because it's, it's difficult. The engineering manager interview is difficult. There's a lot of people. Um, it's difficult because companies are 
see, there's a natural disinclination to hire an engineering manager if there's any doubt that something could be off because the impact of hiring, making a bad hire for an engineering manager is not just that person, right? It could impact an entire team. It could impact an entire org. So it's not even just about you, you know, like if, like if you're an individual contributor and you get hired and you don't work out, okay, then it's kind of like your localized impact that you had. But an engineering manager or leader, CEO, whatever, has a much broader impact. So I think you should really take the interview very seriously because people are going to be, you know, the higher and higher position it is, I think the more um, rightly people are going to be asking very hard questions, you know, about the person and being maybe a little more disinclined to give them the benefit of the doubt because the risk of a bad hire is uh, much greater. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Well, thanks for your time, Vidal. And for the viewer, for the viewers at home, good luck with your upcoming engineering manager interviews. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com. Thanks for watching and good luck on your upcoming interview.